All right, three, two, one. I am here with David Bidler. He is the founder of the Distance Project of Physiology First, as well as Breathe to Perform, which is, and there's a book on Breathe to Perform as well, which will be in my next Amazon order. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so um, Dave, how are you doing today? John, I'm doing fantastic. And I'm so grateful to connect with you, man. I love what you're doing with this show. Yeah, man, I really appreciate that. And, you know, the way that Dave and I got connected for those listening is, um, I actually heard him on another podcast, Rick Alexander's Morning Coffee Podcast, which is another great podcast for you guys to check out. And um, they were having a conversation about mental health, especially in the context of the pandemic coming out of it. And uh, I just really liked the points that Dave was making. And well, both of them were making, honestly, but that Dave was making. And I think when you use the term mental fitness, that really caught my ear, you know, and I was like, yes, I love that term as someone who has gone through my own mental health struggle myself. I think that, and who has been in the mental health field, that's something that I think we, there's so much morbid, you know, like it, it can be such a morbid field sometimes. And that brings such a positive attitude towards it. And I love that. And, you know, I, I provided some praise on social media and, you know, Dave and I started the dialogue, had a great conversation that honestly, I wish we had recorded. <laughs> but, and I loved, um, I immediately, when you and I spoke, I thought, I'm so excited to actually get on the show and riff with you about some of these things. And thank you again. I love the work that you're doing. I love the idea of letting people tell their story and reminding the world that each of us has a story that is, in fact, exceptional. And when right. you did the podcast episode uh, recently with Joseph P. Langdon, author of From the Sandbox to the Cell Block, yeah, a voice who spent 22 years in prison and ended up turning his life towards a path of youth advocacy and public speaking and mentorship. I thought it was one, it was a powerful and incredible story. And I think that it speaks to some of the, um, some of the themes that we'll probably dive into today a little bit. And yeah, absolutely. In a neighborhood where there were not a ton of resources, not a ton of educational opportunities, not a lot of opportunity in general, and got to see what the outcome is and was from a firsthand perspective. To live through it and then to make it through the circle of saying, okay, I found a way out. I'm going to build bridges to help other people right. pay towards a more optimistic, positive future. That was a really inspiring conversation. And I think um, you know, one of the things I, I love about talking with you on the phone is it seems Yeah, like I, I really appreciate that. And I, I think what I liked about my conversation with him is that he was so accountable too. Like he was very 100%. open, literally yep. an open book. He wrote, I mean, he wrote yep. a book on what he did, you know, and, and he was so accountable to what he did. And he still acknowledges the fact that he's still learning and growing. It's honestly been, and I, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning this, but when he texts me sometimes, like I forget sometimes that this is a man who spent 22 years in prison. So he's adjusting to, to some new technology and like the, he'll leave the caps lock on and I'll be like, whoa, like, <laughs> and then well, I'll remember like, you know, like, oh, oh, it's Joe. Like he's, he's, you know, like, He's still um he's he's still figuring some of this stuff out. And he's honestly done an amazing job navigating this stuff, considering the fact that this a lot of this stuff is all new to him. He's you know, like he's been out of prison less than a year. And as he said, he started building this stuff in prison, this business in prison and what he's doing in prison, because he said you have to do it before you get out, or else you'll be left out to dry. Um It's also amazing to think that this is someone who talked about how the world had changed in twenty two years. And I think it's right. our if we can almost imagine how the world might change in another 20 something years, it forces us to right. ask questions about where we're placing, how we're orienting the map of potential. Because I think one of the issues that I know we'll dive into today is the issue of youth mental health and what our nonprofit organization focuses on is absolutely to improving mental health. And I think that that conversation has to exist somewhere on the map of potential. Like, how do we think life should be? Should we be meeting people who are thriving? optimistic, driven, who feel connected, interconnected. Yes, um, absolutely. If that's where we should, where we're orienting the map of potentials, then where we are right now shows how much work we have to do. And if we're yeah. not going to put that, that type of a environment, a thriving, thinking, moving, living, breathing, connected environment on the map of potential, well then they yeah, absolutely fine, but they don't look fine in our communities. And that's why we started some of this work that brought us together. So what was it about, so what was it, because you mentioned right before we pressed record, you know, that, and that part of what Joe's story really kind of connected with the work that you're doing. What was it about 
you know, that episode in particular that connected with the work that you're doing? And could you describe some of the work that you're doing as well for my audience? Yeah, well, you know, you know, thinking, um, you know, Joe mentioned growing up in Brownsville, Brooklyn. I, I grew up in New Jersey, and where I grew up right. was not Brownsville, Brooklyn. But where I grew up had similar issues in terms of gangs to contend with, drugs in the neighborhood, um, and mm-hmm. even that. Uh, a lot of people didn't graduate from it and make it through. I, I personally left the educational, um, in, in institutional education at, in eighth grade. I think right, I remember you saying that, yeah. A lot of the kids in my neighborhood didn't either. So you had kids out on the street at 13, 14, 15, working to kind of try to figure out life without a lot of guideposts. And that looked like a lot of critical mistakes. And if you don't mind me just asking real quick, Dave, what, what, um, what, what era was this in? Like around what was it the nineties when this when you were uh, when you ended up how because I don't know how old you are. It's hard to tell with people who are as good as you. You know, like yes, yeah, we're talking we're talking early nineties. We're talking early nineties, okay. We're talking about a time when the Sony boombox had come out, the purple and orange boombox. There we go. We're talking about a time where everybody in my neighborhood dressed exactly the same. And they and carried it on their shoulder, right? The boombox. You'd know, have the same boombox, right? Yeah. You'd be listening to the same tape same cassette tapes at the time it was like Wu-Tang Enter the 36 Chambers had just come out and it was right. very different this era of art and music and you'd walk by somebody on the street with the exact same set of army fatigues and Timberland boots and radio and cassette tape and stare at one another like you wanted to kill each other like there mm-hmm. couldn't possibly be commonality in these two almost replicant shapes meeting right. on the street A uniformity of- without unity it, that's exactly that's beautifully said and we got to a lot of us at a very young age, experience um, a life with very little mentorship, very little, again, guideposts, and a lot of experimentation in, in alcohol, mm-hmm. drugs. And through that process, I got to experience the other side of physiological resonance. We're talking about mm. complete physiological dysregulation, a lifestyle okay. good by nature, prompt, depressive mental states, anxious. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? You know, at the time, I didn't have a framework for understanding how much my lifestyle was influencing my mental state. I felt gotcha. heavily anxious as a young kid. I was dealing with severe depression at 13, 14, 15. Wow. I was also out drinking most adults. We were living mm-hmm. on a steady diet of, of malt liquor, Newport cigarettes. and um, Right. You no, know, and, and from inside that experience it seemed that the world was hopeless, that the world was dark. And I don't even remember envisioning a future that felt like I was inspired to live towards it. And I couldn't Mm -hmm. until I had experienced the opposite of that, understand where I was placing the bar for potential, my own potential, and then the potential for the community to thrive. Yeah, and what you're doing now is very community involved and you're working with a lot of youth on these things, but you're working with them in Maine, which is a very different environment. Maine, if I, I've never been to Maine, but from what I understand of it, and I don't know a ton about it, but it's much more rural than New Jersey, I would imagine, you know, um, but it does have some similar problems just from kind of a different angle. Would that be, in, would that be a somewhat accurate assessment? One of the, it's a very accurate assessment. You know, we present our seminars at Physiology First, again, our nonprofit organization, to students mm-hmm. in Maine and also to students in New Jersey and students in Boston. So we presented this material in neighborhoods very similar to the one that I grew up in. Uh, very urban neighborhoods. We presented it in very rural neighborhoods. We presented mm-hmm. it in very affluent neighborhoods. And the one thing that ties all of these kids together is physiology. Mm. The body's response, the stress and anxiety response of the body is not, um, it, 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 it's, it's, again, it's the unifying thing that makes us human. And when we measure right. heart rate, skin temperature, pupil dilation, signs of stress, they may have different drivers, but they're not different experiences. And so the toolkit that we can give kids to manage physiological state is very universal even mm-hmm. in very different places. And that, I think, presents, a, it presents it as a powerful tool to share. Yeah, and you have, you have speaking of physiology and wh- where physiology and psychology meet, um, and which, also, which is almost, in a way, I think, where the field of neurology comes from, in a way, because that's the, people don't understand that, the, that there's a difference between the study of the brain and the study of the mind. The mind is more intangible and the brain is a more tangible item and it's more biological. Right behind you, you have three pictures of the brain and I think they are brain scans. Could you explain what what the origins of those are? 
You know, we have a lot of neuroscience art here at the Physiology First University campus. This is a little community center and student lounge that we built to help kids better understand what unites us. And what unites mm -hmm. us is our physiology. It's us right. being these walking upright primates with brains in our skulls and a nervous right. system and things that universally connect us. And yeah. there's a lot of art around neuroscience in here. And the fun part of it, John, is that you don't have to go too deep into synapses in neurons. I think mm -hmm. you just put the biological inner experience in proximity to young people. Because right. You see it around them. And what may separate people out right now are those who have some sense of the fact that we have biological drivers for the human experience. Different right. People who conceptually understand that they have a brain in their skull and that that's mm -hmm. responsible for their processing of the auditory world, the visual world, perception, sensation. I certainly didn't think that when I was 14. Right. It's right. not even, it's not even on your radar. It was a journey you know? to get there. So we hope that we could build bridges along that journey so they weren't monumental steps to yeah. learn what it is that makes you feel, think, and experience the world. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm really into like, you know, spirituality and things like that and, study, and the study of that. And one of the things that comes up in, in various traditions is this concept of, you know, our spiritual reality and our material reality and how we have the idea of, you know, basically where they meet and that's basically what humanity is is where they meet you know and and this idea that we have like our lizard brain or animal brain and then we have our like higher brain which is like what, what leads us the, the lizard brain is our more animal instinct which is necessary in certain areas but if we become over reliant on that that's a problem and if we become over reliant on the ethereal stuff then we stop living in the material reality and we can't connect with people on that level you know and and i think that we're also and I, you and i had this as part of our conversation um you know previously where now there's seems to be a third element being added the virtual reality especially during covid where now we've kind of created this reality where we are disembodied from ourselves but in a way where it's almost like this lower version of the material reality and like it's so interesting because COVID has made us extra dependent on that. And that's part of the reason why I'm taking a break from my podcast after I'm done my recording from season three soon, because, you know, I've been ever since COVID started, I kind of embraced it and was like, I can use this as an opportunity for creation and things like that. But now I just, I want to be back in the physical reality again. Like I don't, I'm tired of the virtual reality. And I think, especially for kids of the age group you're working with, you know, these kids who are in Gen Z, you know, they literally, especially now they I'm, I'm sure they're craving it. They're, they're deeply craving it and it was a big goal of ours in building physiology first university when when i look again at my own path from new jersey to living in complete physiological dysregulation disembodied completely from how lifestyle impacted mental state and then running into a couple of fortunate mentors people who mm -hmm. sort of put my ass into shape they was, was in the world of brazilian jiu-jitsu and so right right realized how training my body affected my mental state. And again, I don't mm -hmm. mean that in an abstract way. I mean, in terms of neurochemicals, in terms of mm -hmm. pure neurological state, mood enhanced, focus improved, clarity improved, anxiety diminished. And I got so, I fell so in love with the art of jujitsu. Right. The ultra marathon racing that I ended up building a small business here in Freeport, Maine, a, a gym. To mm -hmm. share some tools. And it was through that process that we started to meet young people in the community who were experiencing much higher levels of anxiety of mm -hmm. in a brand new landscape that was not like the one that, that you and I grew up in. I didn't right. grow up on an iPhone swiping 2,700 times. Right. I perceived social approval ratings in terms of thumbs up, thumbs down, and hearts, while companies yeah. see something from every angle. So I look at what they were contending with, and it really forced, you know, forced us to ask, how do we not only provide the in-person mentorship experiences mm -hmm. that are ongoing and intergenerational? It's one thing to show up and give a talk. Right. To create a space where kids come three or four times a week and they bring their friends and they yeah. can't talk about the mind, body, and brain, and they can't wait to do more than talk. They like to train. Right, yeah. So and creating... train their mind, body, and brain, yeah. you know? Yep. And that, that's our big goal is if we can... I, I can look back at my own past and say, what if I hadn't met those mentors? We meet people very, um, it seems like um, either, you know, in, in a very faded way or in a completely coincidental mm -hmm. way. 
But it's hard right. actually, for any of us to imagine our own lives without those critical people who turned us to the left, to the right, forward, east, west, right, in a different direction where we found a new perspective, a new toolkit, a new community. Absolutely. I, I always reflect back on the fact that if I didn't have those people, and I didn't find right. those people, I have no idea where my life would be. And I hope that those tools stay very heavily present in communities, especially now as so many businesses that were sourced yeah. fitness are not are not going to be around at the end of the year. Yeah, 